Hi, welcome to class. My name is Don LaFont, Professor Don, and this week in Cisco One, we are covering Module 8, the network layer. If you have any questions, please hold those questions for the end of the presentation if you're here with me live. Ask your questions in the Netacad help discussion forums if, you, if you're in my Netacad class currently. And if you're watching this on YouTube, ask your questions down below in the comments sections, and I'll do my best to swing by every now and then and answer those questions, although I encourage you to answer each other's question. All right, great. Let me go ahead and share my screen. A couple things I have to do here to set this up. One moment, start the presentation. And one more step. All right, great. Module 8, the network layer. All right. So uh, what are we going to learn in this module? Well, I am going to explain how the network layer uses IP protocols for reliable uh, uh, communications. I'll explain the role of the major heading fields in IPv4 and IPv6. I'll explain how network devices use routing tables to direct packets to the destination network. And I'll explain the functions of fields in the routing table of a router. Network layer characteristics. Remember, uh, the network layer is layer three of the OSI model. And at this layer, we the network layer provides services to allow end devices to exchange data. IP version four and IP version six are the principal network layers communicating uh, at this layer. The network layer performs four basic operations, addressing and end devices, encapsulation, routing, D and de-encapsulation. So at this layer, we are adding our IP source and destination um, uh, information to the uh, data stream that's coming down uh, the OSI model uh, from the application layer. And you can see uh, de-encapsulation happens at four and goes up through the final steps. We're gonna let that run one more time. So data uh, is a stream through layers seven, six, and five. When it gets to layer four, we get encapsulation. Uh, it turns into a segment. There we add in the IP address and it becomes a packet. At layer two, we encapsulate uh, the MAC information into it. We learned that last week in the last module. And that MAC information is for next hop. Next hop. Uh, each device has its own MAC layer and it, it changes from one hop to the other, to the next one. But remember the IP address, what we add at layer three, that stays the same from the beginning to, uh, from the source to the destination. IP encapsulation, uh, IP encapsulates the transport layer, the transport layer segment. This is layer four, and um, it uh, encapsulates that layer uh, segment, uh, adding either IPv4 or IPv6 information. Uh, the, um, Neither either works at uh, layer three, uh, and it doesn't impact layer four. That in the data stream and the and the um, uh, segment that's coming from layer four, it doesn't care if it's IPv4, or IPv6. Doesn't matter. Uh, we encapsulate it with the IPv the IP the IP uh, source and destination. Uh, at layer three, the network layer. IP packets will be examined by all layer three devices as it transverses the network. The IP addressing does not change from source to destination. And the note here says that's not exactly true because inside of networks, uh, such as your college uh, network, inside of the network, uh, we have NAT, uh, network address translation, it allows for uh, IPv4 private addressing, which truly expanded the amount of IPv4 addresses that were available from 4.3 uh, billion to 
many, many more, um, obviously. Uh, that's how we continue to use IPv4 addressing. But um, uh, there is a typo there. There is no such, I have to fix that. Okay, hang on a second. I can't leave that. <laughs> there is no such thing as IPv5, at least in networking, we don't use IPv5. So that was a typo. It, and IPv4 NAT does change the address for the, they call it for the final mile uh, from the uh, edge router, your gateway uh, to the post PC that's sending the information. That's private addressing and we'll learn that uh, in, um, uh, in a couple weeks, in a couple modules. All right. Uh, IP is meant to have low overhead and may be described as connectionless, best effort, and media independent. Uh, IP is connectionless. IP does not establish a connection with the destination before sending a packet. Second. There is no control information needed, synchronization, acknowledgements, there's no handshaking, and we'll learn about handshaking as we move forward in this course. The destination will receive the packet when it arrives, but no pre-notifications are sent by IP. If there is a need for connection-oriented traffic, then another protocol will handle it. Tip, uh, typically, for example, it's TCP at the transport layer, which, which we'll learn after we master IPv4 and IPv6 at the layer three. Um, I want to add that this is similar to the post office. When you when you address a letter and a standard letter with 50 cent stamp, and you put it in the mailbox. You have no control of that letter once it leaves. You don't know if it gets to the destination. The destination does not reply saying that it has received the mail. Uh, they might, they, if it's grandma, she might call and say, thank you so much. Or if you get, uh, well, I don't know if that happens anymore, but if grandma sends you a gift in the mail, uh, you want to call her and say thank you, right? Um, so. Uh, it's just like regular mail, not like UPS or FedEx where there's tracking or even uh, priority mail with the UPS where there's tracking and you can see it. Uh, that would be added at layer four if it was a network. At this layer, layer three, it just sends the information. Uh, it's responsible for sending the information, adding uh, the source and destination packet. Uh, information, source and destination uh, addressing information. IP is best effort. IP does not guarantee delivery of the packet. IP is reduced overhead since there is no mechanism to send data that is not received. IP does not expect acknowledgements. IP does not know if the other device is operational or if it received the packet. And in this diagram here, they, they show three packets of information being sent by the host, and it trans, transverse, transverses the network in many different ways, and it gets to the other side. And if there's only two packets, there's only two packets. There's no mechanism to reorder it uh, or even to resend those packets. That happens at a higher level. IP is unreliable. IP cannot manage or fix undeliverable or corrupt packets, undelivered or uncorrupt packets. IP cannot retransmit after an error. IP cannot re realign out of sequence packets. IP must rely on other protocols for these functions. IP is also media independent. IP does not concern itself with the type of frame required at the data link layer or the media type at the physical layer, whether it's fiber, copper, um, wireless, IP can be sent over any media type. And you can see it here, uh, it leaves the source uh, host as copper, gets sent to copy, copper serial, over here it's um, fiber, and at the last mile it is a uh, wireless, no problem. A network layer will establish the maximum transmission unit, MTU. Network layer receives this from con 
uh, from control information sent from the data link layer. The network then establishes the MTU size. Fragmentation is where, when layer three splits the IP, v, uh, IP4 packet into smaller units. Fragmenting, fragmenting causes latency. IPv6 does not fragment packets. Example, a router goes from Ethernet to, to a slow WAN with a smaller MTU. Uh, I like to explain it this way. Uh, let's say you call tech support, and you guys are all techie people. Uh, you call tech support, and you're having a problem with your wireless. Uh, it's not connecting wired devices, and you have already checked some things, and you think your router is bad. So you give a call uh, to uh, the tech support, and, you're, and you just give it all to them. Blah! You just give it all to them, right? You, you tell them what the problem is. You tell them what your trouble shot. You tell them uh, where uh, you think the problem is. And the response you get on the other end is, um, sir, may I have your name? Uh, my name's Don Lafond. And what type of router do you have? And you give them uh, X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Uh, slow down, X, Y, Z, one, right? And then you go on and they don't want to know everything. Uh, they want you to slow down, right? Well, that would be, um, uh, that would be fr fragments, right? It would be, you have to go and, oh, I'm sorry, that's an example of MTUs. As a smaller MTU uh, size, uh, you have to transmit less information at one time. Other technicians, usually maybe at a layer two tech, you get a hold of them and you you blah, you give it all to them and they're like, oh yeah, I know what that problem is. It's, uh, I want you to sign into this and sign into that. And then you have to slow them down if they're asking you to do things that you don't understand. Uh, you can also uh, control the MTU size. All right, hopefully you understand MTU now uh, if you didn't before. Um, IPv4 packet. Uh, the IPv4, IPv4 is the primary communications protocol over the network layer. It's not the newest, IPv6 is, uh, but it has been around for a long time. Uh, and it, it's not the only one that we've had. There were, there were um, uh, IP protocols prior to uh, IPv4, uh, like no, uh, Novell. Um, I, I didn't learn Novell, so I'm not familiar with it, uh, but that was a are a type of um, IP protocol that existed before IP, IPv4. So it's not the newest, it's not the oldest. The network header has many purposes. It ensures the packet is sent in the correct direction to the destination. It contains information for the net, uh, network layer processing in various fields, and we'll go over those fields in a moment. And the information in the header is used by all layer three devices that handle the packet. This is the IPv4 header, um, and I can, uh, and I'll go through each field, and not the ones in gray, those aren't critical at this point, uh, but the version, it's, uh, well, let me, let me explain some characteristics. So first of all, uh, it is in binary, it's ones and zeros, you know that. Uh, it contains several fields of information. Uh, the, the diagram is read from left, left to right, top to bottom, and the two most important fields, obviously, are the source and destination IP addresses. Now, let's go through each field. So, uh, the version, uh, this is uh, the, uh, this tells uh, the, this starts, starts off the packet saying it's an IPv4 and IPv6 um, packet. If it's IPv4, it's 0100. If it's IPv6, it's 0110. That just tells the, the receiving computer what type of, uh, information it is. The DS is used for quality of service, and uh, you'll learn more about that in Cisco 3. Uh, header checksum directs corrupt, detects corruption in the IPv4 header. Uh, time to live, uh, that is the number of uh, hops uh, that the packet will make before it is automatically dropped. Each hop between router to router. Uh, think MAC addresses changing, right, as it moves from router to router. Uh, each hop decrements it by one. When it gets to zero, it is just dropped. Um, protocol, uh, that is the next level up protocol. So if it is an ICMP packet, TCP, UDP, et cetera, 
that is identified in the pro protocol field. Mm -hmm. And uh, the source and destination um, IP address is also um, required at this level. Uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the header. All right, and this is what I was just reading. Now you uh, are going to see a video now on IPv4 header information. Let me open that right now. By the way, if you're watching this class online, uh, you can get these same videos by going to itexaminswers.net. Uh, this software has all of the content and all of the videos that are found inside of Packet Tracer. So I encourage you to go check out these videos. If my recording of a recording isn't very good, just go download and watch uh, the video live. All right, let me maximize this. I have a screenshot from the Wireshark packet capture, and you can see that the second packet that's been captured has been highlighted. And then in the packet details window, the network layer. I'm going to increase the volume a little bit. Hang on a second. Information has been expanded to show us all of the things happening at the network layer. So let's see what's happening in this particular packet that we're examining. We can see that, first of all, the network layer protocol or internet layer protocol that we are dealing with was internet protocol version 4, IPv4. We can also see that the source IP address was 192.168.1.109. You can see it also highlighted up here in the packet list window area. And that the destination IP address was 192.168.1.1. And we can also see that up here. We can see that at the higher layer, this is a TCP protocol packet. But if we limit ourselves to just the IPv4 fields or the IPv4 information, we can see the different types of control information that's contained in every IPv4 packet. For instance, the version number, which is four, identifying this as an IPv4 as opposed to IPv6 packet. The header length or the length of the header, this is the minimum size of an IPv4 header. The differentiated services field, which is used for packet prioritization and is useful for uh, applications like voice over IP. The total length of the packet. The identification number, which is used for fragmentation. The flags, you can see that the DF bit has been set, which stands for don't fragment. This packet is not large enough or is not identified for fragmentation. Uh, fragment offset. The TTL or time to live, which is set to 128. Every time a packet is routed from one hop to the next, the TTL number is reduced. When the TTL number reaches zero, the packet is dropped, ensuring that packets don't circulate on the internet forever on an endless loop. The TTL value is also used in ICMP trace routes and pings. The protocol field lets us know the type of information to expect in the data portion of the packet. A six identifies the data portion of this packet as being a TCP packet. <coughs> the header checksum field, which allows routers to check to see if there are any errors or inconsistency in the IP header. If there is, the packet will be dropped. And then lastly, the source and destination IP addresses, which are the most important part of the IPv4 packet. Let's take a look at two more screenshots of Wireshark packet captures, and we'll see some similarities and differences. The next screenshot shows us that now we're looking at the eight packet capture. The packet's source IP address is also 192.168.1.109, and the destination IP address is 192.168.1.1, except this packet is an HTTP get request. So this is a request to a web server located at 192.168.1.1. You can see that the network layer or internet layer information has been expanded, that it's also the IP version 4 protocol, and that we have similar information in the different fields. Notice under the total length field that this packet is 411 bytes compared to the previous packet which was only 52 bytes. You can tell that this packet has a lot more information or is a much larger packet than the previous one. If we look below 
the internet protocol version four information, we can see the TCP information. And then below that, that there's hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP protocol information in this packet as well. I'll move forward to the next packet. And you can see that this packet is the 16th packet captured right up here. It's also from host 192.168.1.109 to host 192.168.1.1, except this is the ICMP protocol. You can see from the information in the packet list window that this is an echo or ping request. If we look in the internet protocol version four information in the details area, we can see some minor differences. The version is still four, the header length is still 20 bytes, but we can see that the flags are slightly different and that the protocol field is now set to one, indicating that the data portion of this packet is an ICMP protocol message. Notice that in the details window at the bottom here is an expanded area to look at the header information specific to ICMP. Okay, so not too scary. Um, it took me a couple, I don't know, years to remember I all of those fields. Uh, so don't panic uh, if it seems a lot uh, to remember. Uh, you will have plenty of opportunity to uh, work on those, uh, learning the different fields, uh, and uh, at least one packet tracer, which you will be viewing them in this class. So let's talk about IPv6. Uh, now, the reason we have IPv6 is there are several limitations of IPv4. The major one uh, is that we are running out of addresses. So uh, there was only 4.3 billion IPv4 addresses. So we have we have run out of those addresses. Uh, there's also a lack of, and we've replaced it with NAT, which I kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also a lack of end-to-end -end connectivity. To make IPv4 survive this long, private addressing and NAT, network address translation, were created. This ended direct communications with public addressing. So rarely do you find a host computer with a public address, unless it's something like a server, for example, that you want to be able to be directly accessible from uh, the out outside world. Uh, <clears throat> also, it increases network complexity. NAT was meant to be a temporary solution and, uh, and creates issues on the network as a side effect of manipulating the network headers, uh, head network header addressing. Uh, NAT causes latency and troubleshooting. Think about every translation from a private address to a public address needs a CPU uh, to be involved uh, in a router. So, Obviously, there's just going to be that moment difference. You add up a bunch of moments, and now you've got a real uh, latency. Here they show you uh, IPv6, uh, and the graphic on the right I like a lot because it shows you what uh, uh, IPv4 has uh, has uh, 4.3 billion addresses, this is as many has, and this is what um, IPv6 has. It has 340 undecillion addresses, and that's how many zeros you have after the the 10, 36, I think that says. And uh, the uh, they like to I like to say uh, that there's enough uh, addresses in IPv6 for an individual IP address for every grain of sand on the planet. I've also been uh, we did some playing around and we found out that you can there you would have several trillion addresses for every human on the planet. Uh, so, for example, each one of your blood cells uh, could have its own IP addressing and maybe it would report to a human a computer in your body that would discard damaged blood cells. Who knows? Right. Um, I used to say we'd never go through all of those uh, addresses, but if you got IP IP for every a blood cell, uh, then it is definitely something uh, that uh, we could start working on. I'm sure the people that created IPv4 said, you know, when they had, you know, 20 computers, they were like 4.3 billion addresses. Like, when are we ever going to use all of those addresses? Uh, but of course, uh, we know better. Uh, here in my home alone, I have 46 uh, IP, IPv6 addressed elements like uh, the Internet of Things uh, elements like 
my uh, my hue light bulbs and my my um, uh, my uh, um, range and my dryer and heck my car has its own IP address. Uh, it is uh, Tesla, and so it, um, it I can talk to it anytime I want using that IPv6 address. Uh, IPv, IPv6 is a global, is globally addressable, uh, so it eliminated, eliminates the need for NAT in IPv4 because everything, you can look at the side of my light bulb and you can read the IPv6 address that's just stamped on it. So when that light bulb gets thrown away, that address will be forever gone from the world. But who cares? We got 340 billion addresses. This is the IPv6 header. It is simplified, but not smaller in size. The header is fixed at 40 bytes or octets long. It's several, IPv, uh, several IPv4 fields were removed to improve performance. The IPv4 fields that were removed include flag, flag uh, fragment offset, and header checksum. Remember, we don't fragment IPv6. So the different steps, remember the version, I already told you version is 0110, which is six in binary. Uh, the traffic class is used for QoS information. Uh, flow label uh, informs the device to handle identical flow labels the same way. So when a, the first flow label comes through, it is processed when the next one comes through. If it's identical, it's just processed the same way. So there's no, you save some time and latency in that case. Uh, the payload length is obvious. It's a 16 fit, uh, 16 bit field indicating the length of the data portion or the payload of the IPv6 packet. The next header is, is um, it tells uh, the, the, uh, the router uh, what the next level protocol is, IPv, ICMP, TCP, UDP, uh, much like IPv6. Hot limit is, hop limit does the same thing. Almost, it does the same thing as TTL, um, but it just does it in a little bit different way. Uh, basically, allowing stopping IPv6 packets from forever transmitting, uh, forever transversing the internet. And then you have your IPv6 uh, uh, source and destination addressing. Uh, here, uh, IPv6 packets also contain extension headers. Extension headers uh, characters provide optional head, uh, network layer information. They're optional. They're placed between the IPv6 header and the payload, and it may be used for fragmentation, security, mobile support, etc. cetera. Um, it, it's beyond the scope of this class. We don't talk about it, and we don't teach it. Uh, in in uh, Cisco One, so don't worry too much about that. Just know they exist. Unlike IPv4 routers, do not fragment IPv6 packets. And we have a video, uh, video 8.3.5. Let's go pull that up. 8.3.5. This screenshot shows a packet capture using Wireshark and the network layer information from an IPv6 conversation. Let's take a look at it. In this screenshot, we can see that the highlighted packet is packet number 46, and that the source address up here in the packet list window shows that it is a global unicast IPv6 address. You can see this starting with the 2001 colon 6F8. The destination address is also a global unicast address 2001, 6F8, 900, and so on. And if we look over in the protocol field, we see that at the upper layers, this is a TCP packet, and that it's an attempt to establish an initial communication with an HTTP web server. If we look down in the network layer information area, you can see that the IPv6 information has been expanded. Let's take a look at some of the protocol field information for internet protocol version six. First of all, you can see that the amount of information in the IPv6 header is much smaller than in the IPv4 header. Now, there are some interesting features. For one, you can see that the version field is the same. In this case, it says six, identifying this packet as IPv6. We can also see the binary six here. The next field is the traffic class field. 
The traffic class field serves the same function as the differentiated services field in an IPv4 packet. It handles traffic prioritization and congestion. The next section you can see is the flow label. The flow label field is a new field for the IPv6 protocol. Its purpose is to maintain the same packet flows through routers and switches so as to help real-time applications that need packets to arrive in the same order. You can see the next field is the payload length field. This is the same as the total length field in the IPv4 header. This field tells us the total size of the packet, in this case, 40 bytes. The next header field serves the same purpose as the protocol field for IPv4. You can see that it's identifying that the upper layer data portion of this packet is a 6 or TCP. The hop limit serves the same function as the TTL field in an IPv4 packet. You can see that the hop limit currently is set to 64 hops. Once this decrements to zero, the packet will be dropped. Next, we have the source IPv6 address, the destination IPv6 address, and then at the upper layer, we can see that this is a TCP packet with TCP header information. Let's take a look at the next screenshot. In the next screenshot, you can see that we've now highlighted packet number 49, and now we have a connection with this web server. This packet is now a GET request to the web server. If we look down in the expanded Internet Protocol version 6 packet details window, we can see that the payload length is a lot larger. We can see below the IPv6 information, the TCP information, and that now there is HTTP protocol information as well within our GET request. This is our GET request to get a web page. If I go to the next screenshot, the last screenshot shows an ICMP version 6 neighbor solicitation message. If we look up in the window at the highlighted packet here in packet number one, we'll see that the source address this time is not a global unicast IPv6 address, but a link local address. We can tell that from the FE80 here. We can also see that this link local address used EUI64 to resolve the interface identification portion of the address. We can tell that by the FFFE within the address. The destination address is an FF02 IPv6 address, indicating that this is a multicast packet. If we look over at the protocol, we see that it's ICMP version 6, and then information about the packet tells us that this is a neighbor solicitation message for the same device that we were contacting in the earlier screenshots. The function of this packet essentially is similar to an ARP request in IPv4. We need to discover the link local address of this device, so we send out an ICMP version 6 neighbor solicitation message, multicasted, and we're hoping to get back a link local address from this neighbor. If we look down in the expanded details window, we can see the version is 6, traffic class flow label, payload length, which is the entire length of the packet. The next header field, which is like the protocol field in IPv4, indicating at 58 that this is an ICMP version 6 message in the data portion of the packet. The hop limit, 255 hops. This is similar to the TTL field. And then the source link local address and the destination multicast IPv6 address. At the bottom below, the IPv6 information, we can see that there's an expandable area specific to the Internet Control Message Protocol version 6. All right. Again, hopefully, that's a good starting point for you to understand each field. And I like how he goes to Wireshark to actually show you the actual packet and that packet information. Um, you will, like I said, do a, a lab on that here in this course, um, and uh, you'll be able to see that for yourself. That's why we installed Wireshark a little bit ago. All right, here we go. Keep going. How does a host route? How does a host? How a host routes? <laughs> okay. Uh, how a router 
uh, route uh, information from a host. Maybe that would be a better way to state that. Uh, because ultimately, uh, we take uh, a, a, a packet of information, a frame of information from PC1, uh, and if it's if it's within a network, it can transmit right here within the network. Um, it can um, it can transmit to itself uh, it do using something called a um, uh, loop local, not loop local, a uh, um, up. Oh, it's I've lost the word here. Sometimes that happens when you're in front of a camera. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that's a loop back uh, when it talks to itself. Uh, that would be uh, one two seven zero zero one or two or three. And you can have several different loop backs. Uh, they can also talk uh, to a local host within the same LAN, so it never leaves talking to the switch here. And then it can also obviously talk to the internet, things out on the web, such as this remote host. The source, the source device determines whether the destination is local or remote. Uh, the method of this determination, well, if it's IPv4, the source uses its own IP address and subnet mask along with the destination IP address and subnet mask to determine if it's on the same network. IPv6, the source uses the network address and the prefix, uh, usually slash 64, don't worry, we'll get there, uh, advertised by a local router. Local traffic is dumped out the host interface to be handled by an intermediary device, switch router, et cetera. Remote traffic is forwarded directly to the default gateway, and I don't like the way it says uh, forwarded directly to the default gateway. It, it's almost like somehow they think there's a way around the switch no it it ultimately makes it through the switch to the router so don't there's no magic here um, it is uh still uh passed through our switch I, we learned that last week we spent a lot of time understanding how packets are uh how uh, our requests are made for example to be able to get uh the uh, address of the router to be able to send information to uh, uh, uh another address on the local network or the router, the, def uh, the, the gateway of last return, the edge router heading out to the internet. A router or layer three switch can be a default gateway. Uh, the features of a de default gateway, abbreviated DGW, one of my least favorite uh, acronyms, uh, it must have an IP address in the same range, the same network as the rest of the LAN. It cannot accept data from the LAN and is capable of forwarding traffic. Uh, it cannot accept data from the LAN um, and is capable of forwarding traffic off of the LAN. I think there's a typo there. It can accept data. Oof, my goodness. How many times can I read that and have it read wrong? It can accept data. Uh, from the LAN, from other hosts on the network, and it can send information off. And then it can also route to other networks. Uh, if a device has no default gateway or a bad default, incorrectly uh, configured gateway, its traffic will not be able to leave the LAN and those packets will be dropped. Host routes to a default gateway. The host will know the default gateway either statically or through DHCP in an IPv4 network. Uh, the uh, statically will learn in this presentation in just a, a few slides. It might be in the next presentation, but I think it's in this presentation. IPv4 sends the default gateway through a router um, solicitation, RS, uh, or that's IPv6. IPv6 uses a router solicitation message uh, to uh, send information to the, the default gateway, and it can be configured manually. Uh, default gateway is a canal, uh, is static route, which uh, the default gateway uh, is a static route, which will be a last resort route in the routing table at the bottom. Uh, and all devices on the LAN will need a default gateway uh, off the router uh, to the router if they intend to send traffic outside of the network. Uh, on a Windows, you can see the routing table by typing netstat-r, 
Uh, remember, a router is just a, a special type of PC. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, it works in the same way. You just get to it a little bit different with this netstat-r. And here in this uh, routing table, you can see uh, that you have some multicast routes, you have a um, all nodes broadcast, and you have a couple individual uh, addresses here, for example, you know about uh, this one device that's on that network. Anyways, don't worry too much about uh, the PC's routing table. It's pretty easy to understand. Uh, where it's going to uh, and it's the IP address uh, and the uh, network map, the net mask, the, uh, the subnet, uh, the gateway, uh, and then uh, the interface that you are going to exit your PC. And then um, the uh, metric is the cost of the the traveling between the source and the destination. You learn more about that when we get to, to Cisco 2 and then OSPF afterwards. Um, we don't really learn too much about um, the cost of uh, inner routing, uh, inner router routing uh, in this course. Uh, the introdu introduction to routing. Okay, so how does a router forward packets? Well, uh, the uh, receive, the packet receives a frame, uh, the, the PC sends a frame, and it sends two, in this case, it's sending two, uh, the IP address 10.1.10, 10.1.1.10, .1 .1 uh, and um, that's the destination, and uh, from multiple packets, they're sent uh, through the router. Now, that, that that's this PC over here. Uh, so, the right in this case, the uh, the PC knows the destination P, uh, PC's address. Uh, the router knows it. This is router one's table. You can see that it already has router one. Uh, router one. I'm sorry. That's this packet. This is router one's um, routing table. It doesn't look like this at all, but we'll see that soon enough. Uh, so this is a routing table. It says, yeah, to get to this network, you go through that network, a uh, router two and off it goes, right? Uh, to get uh, to the default gateway, um, let's see, and it also knows how to get to the 10 network here. Uh, it's directly connected to G0, um, that's not true, it's uh, on interface G00. It's actually connected to the switch. Uh, it knows how to get to this network uh, that's on this interface. Uh, and it also has a static route uh, that goes uh, we call that quad zeros. That means anything that is not uh, included above, any routes that are not in the routing table, if you wanted to go to Google 8.8.8.8, for example, you would, it would, this default route would pick it up and it would be sent to the default gateway, which is right here, uh, R2. And then R2 would handle it and say, hey, do I know where Google is? And if it does, it would send it directly there. If it doesn't, it would send it to its default gateway. And that's pretty much what that writing says there. Uh, there are three types of routes in a routing table, in a router's routing table. There are directly connected routes. So if you take a switch uh, and you uh, plug it in, the router will consider that uh, a directly connected network and it will configure it automatically. Uh, and any host that is on that network will be able to talk to the router once it has the default gateway configured. Um, it can, a router can route to remote uh, destinations and that is either manually or dynamically. Manually it uses a static route and we learn that on the next slide I think. And then it can also learn uh, about uh, destination routes dynamically uh, using EIGRP, OSPF, uh, RIP. Uh, there are several different protocols that uh, routers talk to each other on. Um, and then uh, you can also have a default route uh, that forwards all traffic to a specified uh, in a specified direction when there is not a match to in the routing table. 
so all they're saying with this video is we have uh, the router can uh, is directly connected to this. This router is directly connected to this network and that network. So you'll have a C um, in the routing table that indicates directly connected. And you will also have an L for the actual interfaces. We'll see that in a few minutes. L2 is connected to this network and this network, and it will have directly connected um, uh, entries in its routing table for, for the G000 on 10.1.2.1 and 209.165.200.1 on 10.1.2.1. Uh, which is on G001. That'll be on router two. And of course, it'll also have this link as well. Now, uh, router two can learn about this network through R1. Uh, you can either put it in a default route. Well, you want to go default route that way, but you, yeah, you can put, I'm sorry, uh, not the default. Um, you can put a default route that way, uh, but you would probably use one of these guys. This is called a static route. And basically the router, you have a static route telling in R2, telling R, R, um, sorry, in R1, no, no, in R2, you'd have a static route saying to get to this network, you need to go through this network, R1. R1 would have a default route, they're showing it here, a static route that you put in, not a default route, sorry, static route that you put in, uh, saying, hey, to get to this network, the way you do it is you go, this is the command IP route, by the way, IPv6 uh, is IPv6 route. And then the network you're going to, the network, that network's subnet, and then the next hop IP address. So that's this address right here, 226. We're going the other way. Uh, it would be um, from R2 to R1 to get to this network, it would be IP route, uh, to get to uh, 192.168.10.0.255.255.255, uh, you would use the next hop. This router would use the next hop IP address here, uh, 209.165.200.225. I just showed you going both ways. This router, it shows it here going here, and this router, uh, I just told you what it would be going that way, just to give you another example. Uh, now, uh, the um, if you have a manually configured static route, uh, which is fine for small networks that don't change, uh, you have a problem when a, a router a line breaks, because if this line breaks, the static route says go this way. The router will not can reconfigure. It will not configure the router, to, the information to go this way because you have a static route saying how to get to the ne next network. Uh, it's not going to go this way. Now, there are ways to, to add floating routes, uh, which is a second static route uh, that would allow you to go this way, and it would only become enabled uh, if the, the primary line goes down. You wouldn't even see it in the routing table. It would be there and it would show up only if the first line goes down. All right. Dynamic routing. Dynamic routes route automatically. They discover remote networks. They're ma they maintain up-to-date information. They choose the best path to the destination. And if there's a problem, they find the new best path uh, when or when there's a topology change. If there's a break in the line or a topology change, it will find the new best path. Remember, or I should say, um, the router only ke keeps the best path. If there are two or three or five different routes to get from one place to another, it figures out the router, if it's using it dynamically, it figures out which is the best route. Remember that thing I talked about metric a little while ago? Um, it determines which is the best route. If it's RIP, it's just how many how many hops along the way. But if it's uh, EIGRP or OSPF, which are not discussed in this class, uh, but if it's a, one of those routing tables, it uses a metric, uh, and a metric is just saying a highway uh, uh, is a uh, faster connection than a dirt road. Right? That's metric. Dynamic route. Uh, routing can also 
share static default routes with other routers. So just because you configured uh, router one to have a static route to R2, uh, if you if you set up um, OSPF or EIGRP between these three routers, uh, R1 will share the static route uh, with other routers, so they'll end, they'll have a, a path to get to the network as well. And I got a video for you. It is eight five five. A router uses information in its routing table to forward packets. A routing table displays entries listing all the networks that a router is aware of and the best path to reach them. It is very important to be able to read and understand the entries in a routing table. In this demonstration, we'll take a look at a router's IPv4 routing table in detail. But first, let's examine the network topology. It actually consists of five separate networks or subnets. There are four LANs, two connected to each router, and one WAN connection between the two routers. If we look at R1, it has three directly connected networks. Network 192.168.1.0 connected to interface G0-0-0. Network 192.168.2.0 connected to interface G0 slash 0 slash 1 and network 209.165.200.224 connected to interface S0 slash 1 slash 0. R2's LANs are not directly connected to R1, therefore they are considered to be remote networks as far as R1 is concerned. In order to forward data to remote networks, a router needs to learn about them first through the use of static or dynamic routing. In this example, R1 has learned about them through the dynamic routing protocol OSPF, which has been configured on both routers. To view the IPv4 routing table, I'll click on router R1, and from the CLI tab, I'll press enter to connect to the command line. From here, I'll type enable and press enter to enter privilege exec mode. And from here, I'll issue the show IP route command to view the routing table. If I press the space bar, I will see the full output. At the top of the output are letter codes that indicate how each network, aka route, was learned. This is referred to as the route source. Underneath that, we can see the routing table entries. These represent all the networks that R1 knows about and the best way to reach them. Let's further examine some individual entries. First, let's look at the entry for network 192.168.1.0. The letter C in front of the entry is the route source and indicates that the source of this route is a directly connected network. And you can also see that in the entry here. Gigabit Ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 0 is the interface to which that network is connected. Now let's look at the entry for network 10.1.1.0. This entry has a route source of O which indicates that it was learned via OSPF routing. After the network address, you can see two numbers in brackets that are used by the router to help determine the best path to the network. The first number is the administrative distance, which indicates the trustworthiness or preference rating of one route over another. Next is the metric, another value used by the router to help determine the best path. The metric may be calculated using hop count, bandwidth, or some other factor. This network is reachable via this next hop address, which represents an interface on router R2. This is a timestamp that tells us how long ago this router last received an update on this route. And serial 0 slash 1 slash 0 is the exit interface on R1 
through which to send the packets. For the purposes of this demonstration, you can ignore any entries that do not list a route source at the beginning. These are basically headings. Also note that for each directly connected network, you have an entry below it with a route source of L. L refers to a local route, and basically this is the IP address of the interface to which that network is connected. This routing table shows that R1 is aware of all five networks present in the topology. It has three directly connected networks, It has two networks that are remote and were learned through OSPF routing. And lastly, if you look at the last entry in the table, you will see a statically configured default route. This manually configured route can be used to forward any packets that don't have a specific entry in the routing table. The purpose of a default static route is so that the router will not drop any packets. These are just some of the basics of an IPv4 routing table. Okay, and so let's get to the actual routing table and see if I can add anything to her video. Um, I, I just want, uh, I, I love having this table for the first couple of years I taught the course. Um, I really relied on this table to know what each element was. And so when you, when you type in show IP route, uh, it will show you the table that helps you to understand what all these letters mean on the left hand side. Once you do it for a while, then you know what a C and an L and an O and a, uh, and, uh, and what an, um, uh, I'm looking for uh, <clears throat> um, what they all mean, a D, uh, E, I, G, or P is D. Anyways, so uh, when we get down below, uh, they, you can see here is a static route that's been configured, uh, and it's the default gateway, uh, the gateway of last resort. And below that, you have something learned by o, um, OSPF, two directed uh, directly connected networks. This is R1, so you have two directly connected networks. And we also know about this network uh, through OSPF. Route, the routers basically chatter, R1 and R2 talk. Uh, so we don't have a directly connected, um, we don't have a static uh, route and it's not directly connected. Uh, how are we gonna learn about this network? We're gonna learn it through uh, OSPF. Uh, you can also learn it through EIGRP, which is um, taught in Cisco 3. All right. And, uh, the, and again, it wasn't clear when I first took the course way back when. Uh, the uh, C, this is the network address, right? So the 10 network. Immediately after the C, you'll find an L. Uh, if you do a routing table, show IP route on a router that doesn't have Ls, that means you're using... Uh, uh, the operating system, iOS 12 or earlier, uh, iOS 15 added the Ls to local connections. So this is the IP address for that network. This is the IP address for that network. Hopefully that helps. And that is the end of this very first uh, present, well, module eight's presentation. Um, I have another one to go through this evening, uh, but hopefully that was informational. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we are taking it in bites, right? You can't eat the elephant uh, unless you do it bite by bite, right? That's what we're talking about with Cisco. Actually, all of these courses build one on top of another. So all of these concepts are learning in Cisco. We're learning in Cisco two. We revisit in Cisco three. I mean, Cisco 2, and then we visit them again in Cisco 3, and we build and we build and we build until we understand the entire animal and not just uh, a toenail. Uh, so uh, my name is Don Lafon, Professor Don. It's been my pleasure to teach you today. If you have any questions and you're live with me now, just wait a moment and you can ask. If you are watching this inside of our Netiquette cast classroom, please ask your questions in the help discussion forum. And if you are watching this on YouTube, Please rate and review, and I uh, 
um, please rate and review and ask questions down below. And I will visit occasionally and take a look and see if anybody's chatting. And I love to participate uh, with my students. So you can, you can count on that. Thank you very much for coming. I'll see you later. Bye now.